Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in today's webinar. My name is Brayden McNeil. I'm the technical sales and marketing lead here at Aquanti. I think I've been in contact with almost everyone here, but if uh, if I if you haven't or if you have questions about Hydrogeosphere, Aquanti, any of our technology or our projects, feel free to reach out to me anytime. My email address is the, in there uh, in the chat. Um, we're really hoping that the webinar today will spur thoughts and, and lead to further partnerships with water, water resources experts across Canada and the world. Um, if there are if there's anything in this project or in this presentation that interests you, if you have any ideas or projects of your own that we might be able to help with, definitely encourage you to reach out to us. Um, Steve, you can go to the next slide. Before we truly begin, I'd like to make a quick land acknowledgement, as is the case with almost every nation with a colonial history. Canada has a very difficult history fraught with historical injustices perpetrated against the indigenous people of this land. As a country, we're attempting to embark on a journey of truth and reconciliation, acknowledging the truth of the historical crimes committed against the original inhabitants of this land and making sincere efforts for reconciliation uh, and to restore Canada's relationship with the indigenous people of this land. So this land acknowledgement is just one small way that we at Aquanti can contribute to that effort. Aquanti is based in Waterloo, Ontario. It's a city situated right in the middle of what's known as the Haldeman Tract, which you can see in green on that image to the right. This tract of land is located on the traditional territory of the neutral Atawandaran, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee's people. The land was quote unquote, given to the Six Nations of the Grand River as compensation for their role in the American War for Independence, during which these indigenous nations fought for the British. As you can see today, less than 5% of this treaty land is still under the administration of the Six Nations of the Grand River. And Aquanti would just like to acknowledge our privilege and express gratitude for being able to live and work on this territory. Now I'll just do a quick introduction for today's speaker. Steve Berg is the president and CEO at Aquanti and is also an adjunct assistant research professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Waterloo. Steve received his PhD in Earth Sciences from the University of Waterloo, focusing on hydrogeology and numerical modeling, and also has an MBA from Wilfrid Laurier University. Steve joined Aquanti in 2020, 2013 as employee number three with a focus on integrated modeling for mining applications. In 2015, Steve took over, over the role of president and CEO and has been straddling both the technical and business sides of Aquanti ever since. Thanks in advance, Steve, for taking the time to deliver today's presentation. We're all really eager to hear your perspective on the history of integrated hydrologic modeling with HGS and what the future holds for hydrogeosphere. Take it away. That's great. Uh, thanks so much, Braden. So before we get started into the meat of the, the presentation, I want to start with a, a few definitions just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, and really the, the main reason for this is the term digital twin has been gaining in terms of usage recently, particularly in hydrology, but it's often used in many different ways and um, sometimes <laughs> incorrectly as well. So I thought it'd be good just to kind of ground us and have a, a common definition for what we're talking about today. So uh, in terms of a model, this is fairly straightforward. I think we're all familiar with this concept. So I just went straight to the Oxford English Dictionary for this definition. It's a simplified or idealized description or conception of a particular system, uh, often in terms of mathematical expression. Uh, it can be put forward as a basis for theoretical or empirical understanding and for calculations and predictions. So this is the camp that something like a hydrogeosphere, mod flow, et cetera, when you build up models with them would fall into. In contrast, a digital twin has a model as a component of what a digital twin is. Uh, in addition to the model, it's an evolving set of data related to the object. So that could be observations from the field that are ingested on a regular basis, and then a means of dynamically updating or adjusting the model in accordance with the data. So this is some sort of assimilation process, and then you might use the digital twin on the fly to make predictions. Uh, and I wanted to draw this contrast because um, where we're going with our models is to turn them into digital twins in terms of uh, real-time hydrologic forecasting. And so for this talk, we're gonna uh, kind of go and give an overview of the history of integrated modeling. What are the key strengths of integrated modeling? Look at some applications and then look at how do we turn them into digital twins and then where is that heading in the future? 
Uh, so I kind of just covered this outline. We'll talk about you know the history of integrated modeling, what are models, what are digital twins, and then some thoughts on on the future. So um, all integrated models, integrated hydrologic models, can, can draw their history back to this um, landmark paper by Fries and Harlan that came out in 1969. It was titled uh, Blueprint for a Physically Based Digitally Simulated Hydrologic Response Model. And really they laid out that the framework for um, how to build these models and how to conceptualize them. Uh, this is figure one from that paper. Um, the red highlights are just my highlights to emphasize the bolding that they had in the figure because it didn't stand out very well. Uh, and what we see here is what their recommended path within the world of different approaches for uh, modeling were to develop a physics-based digitally simulated hydrologic response model. And you can see that they considered lumped versus distributed, even physical models, analog models. Uh, and this is kind of the recommended path forward that they had in, back in 1969. And this is the path that models like uh, ModFlow, HGS, et cetera, have, have followed. In, in this paper, they identified um, three major obstacles at the time. We have to remember this is over 50 years ago, so the science was still in its infancy. Uh, there were three major obstacles that needed to be overcome before this blueprint could be fully realized. The first one was, do we understand the key water cycle processes well enough to represent them within a numerical model? Uh, and I'd say over the past 50 years, you know, this has definitely been accomplished both for uh, overland flow as well as subsurface flow. Um, you know, both uh, hydrologists and hydrogeologists have been working on these separately for decades, and um, that science is quite mature. With an integrated model, we're bringing that together, the knowledge from both camps. Uh, similarly, uh, for the question of, does the data exist to build such models? Um, one of the questions that we often get from new modelers who have only used a surface water only or groundwater model only model is, well, where do I find the, the data for the other domain? And it's not that it's not out there, it's just a lack of familiarity. Both disciplines have been collecting data or using expert judgment when there's missing data for, for decades now. And recently, um, there's been a big push for open data. Uh, Canada is an excellent example of this with the Canada One Water Initiative where uh, national scale homogenous data sets are being made available that can be used to drive the construction of uh, both surface water and groundwater models as well as fully integrated models. So I think the second uh, concern that Fries and Harlan had has also been sufficiently addressed. And then the last one they had is, uh, do we have the computational resources to run the simulations in an economical manner? And you can imagine, you know, 50 years ago, the computing resources were nowhere near what they are today. Um, and not just, you know, advances due to Moore's law, but there's also been, um, you know, advances in, in numerical methods, uh, parallelization, HBC, et cetera, that has really brought us to the point where we can start to build these uh, large scale, complicated, nonlinear, fully integrated hydrological models um, and, and deploy them in uh, meaningful manners because we have the uh, computational resources available. So these are the three major objectives or um, obstacles that Friesen Harlan identified. And I'd say that you know we've addressed them um, sufficiently over the past 50 years. This graph just shows kind of the cumulative citation count um, for, for the Friesen Harlan paper going back to 1969. And you can see for the first couple of decades, had very little movement. And then in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, really started to take off as integrated modeling, particularly became more popular. And I'm just going to overlay kind of the history of, of hydrogeosphere on, on this growth path. So back around 1995, maybe it was 94, uh, FRAC 33 DVS was first published, which was Rene Therrien's PhD, which I think was finished perhaps in 92. Um, and that was really the basis of the subsurface component of hydrogeosphere. Then in the early 2000s, uh, the overland domain and evapotranspiration was added, uh, and that's when it became hydrogeosphere. Then hydrogeosphere was paralyzed in 2012 by Dr. Hun Tai Wang as part of his PhD. Um, Ed Siddiqui and the founders founded a quanti in 2012. And then, um, you know, we've been working away with hydrogeosphere for several years and started to develop the forecasting platform HGSRT uh, in the late 2010s, early 2020s. And most recently, uh, well, it's not released yet, but I believe January 2024, we'll have a, a GUI for HGS released as well. Um, 
And so it's just interesting to see kind of the evolution of integrated modeling from our perspective as it overlays on the citation count and history of Fries and Harlan. So this slide kind of shows the uh, bottom left here, the conceptual model for, for hydrogeosphere. It doesn't have all of the features, but it has a lot of them. Uh, hydrogeosphere has a 3D variably saturated subsurface. Uh, it has 1D, domain, uh, 1D channel flow as well as 2D overland flow in the overland flow domain. Uh, it's got evapotranspiration, so that's uh, root water uptake and transpiration as well as soil and uh, surface evaporation, winter processes, so snow accumulation, snow melt, and soil freeze thaw, thaw as well as um, you know many different types of subsurface domains as well, such as fractures, tunnels. Uh, it can be, you know, represent quite complex models. Um, so once you have the conceptual model, you move it to a numerical model, uh, you parameterize it, and then you get to your operational numerical model. Uh, we're going to kind of talk through some of these key steps in a little more detail um, with a particular emphasis on the conceptual model and how to think about um, designing your problem so that it's appropriate for uh, a fully integrated HGS simulation. Uh, before I get into the conceptual model in a little more detail, um, I wanted to talk a bit about the, the domain coupling, and this is really where um, a tightly coupled model like hydrogeosphere shines and what makes it so powerful in comparison to a, a loosely coupled model, which might be, um, say, like uh, a surface water model bolted onto something like ModFlow, where it wasn't two models that were designed to work with each other, whereas hydrogeosphere from the ground up has been designed to be a, a fully coupled model, a tightly coupled model, fully integrated. And the way this is accomplished is by embedding exchange flux terms within the flow equations for the different domains. So here we show an example for the porous medium domain and the surface water flow domains. And it, within those governing equations, there are exchange flux terms that allow for the free movement of water between domains when the equations are solved. So we assemble all the equations into one global matrix and solve it simultaneously. So that way we don't have to iterate between different model types. Um, that improves runtime, mass balance, accuracy, et cetera. And so this type of approach is taken uh, within HGS when we're coupling any domain. So there could be fractures or 1D channel flow, uh, dual porosity, dual permeability domains. Uh, but that's really kind of the core uh, gem of what makes HGS so powerful in the way it solves these equations. So what, what does this mean in, in practice? If you've got, um, say, a surface and subsurface domain that's tightly coupled, um, you know, what are the advantages of that? What, what, what makes it unique? And so one of the first things that really jumps out is that it's um, much simpler to set up these models. So the, the surface boundary condition is, is simplified considerably compared to, say, a groundwater model where you have to think about what is the recharge and estimate it and use that as a boundary condition with HGS. We like to say you just rain on the model and it solves everything else. And, you know, it is pretty close to that simple. You bring in your precipitation uh, rasters or time series, your potential evapotranspiration, and let the model solve the movement of water between surface and subsurface domains. So there's a free exchange of water there and recharge is calculated internally. It doesn't have to be prescribed to the model, uh, which is a real huge benefit in terms of uh, setting up the models and, and minimizing sources of uncertainty. Um, it's also really good, this approach at uh, reflecting complex near surface dynamics, such as perched water tables. Um, you know, if you had, uh, say, a, a surface water model and a groundwater model that weren't built to work to e with each other and the groundwater model was fully saturated, you wouldn't be able to represent perched water table conditions. Um, this approach also excels in steep topography, like mine environments or engineered landscapes, um, and really good at looking at evapotranspiration and, and near surface um, dynamics. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, multiple domain domain interactions possible. So it doesn't just have to be surface and subsurface. You can put in fractures, you can put in 1D channels. Um, you know, we don't recommend turning everything all on at once, but you can definitely uh, layer in quite a bit of complexity. And the animation on the, the right here is just an illustration of a simple cross-sectional model that has a surface domain, a subsurface domain, and then discrete fractures within it. And you see here that there's some precipitation on the land surface. The depression fills up. It spills over into the next depression, starts to infiltrate. You get these perched conditions on a, a clay aquitard. There's fractures through that aquitard. 
they start to activate and then you get the water flowing through uh, to the deeper water table. Um, and so it's just a nice simple illustration of how all these domains can kind of be packaged up together within a single simulation and really complex dynamics can be represented within hydrogeosphere. So then if we take a, a step back um, to thinking about how we design these models, the you know conceptual model is, is really the first place that everyone should start when when thinking about their models. Um, and we've got, you know, just some things to consider. Um, this is by no means a comprehensive list, and Braden's got some uh, webinars and sessions that dig a little bit more deeper in, into model setup. But, you know, you want to start thinking about what are the questions that you're trying to answer with your model um, so that the model, you know, that should carry through and the model is designed appropriately to address those questions. Um, do you need all the domains? What are the governing equations? How do they get parameterized? You, know, you want to make the model as complex as necessary, but not overly complex if you can avoid it. Um, think about what are the water sources um, and sinks within your model. Uh, if it's a watershed scale model, it could be as simple as you're just raining on it and letting water come out with evapotranspiration or flow to the domain. Uh, for engineering type applications, it could be much more complicated where you've got water routing, pumping, all sorts of you know engineered activities. Um, and then also where are the areas of interest and what parts of the model should be refined in more detail so that you can get the resolution necessary to answer your, answer your questions in that area. Uh, and the last comment here is that, you know, you should strive for scale appropriate physical realism. Uh, we'll see a little later on what that means, but the idea is that if you're building, say, a, a let's say a continental scale model, you're probably not going to be able to represent uh, you know, each and every little pumping well within that model. And there might be ways you need to upscale that. So you always want to think about the scale and um, whether what you're including in it is appropriate for the scale of the model. Some of that comes from experience and some of that, um, you know, we probably have some examples that would help guide users uh, on how to think about those problems as well. Uh, some other considerations when, when designing your conceptual model, and these are just kind of ideas to get you thinking about some of the points on the last slide. So, you know, if you're working on a, a say, a deep geological repository, do you need to consider um, unsaturated flow or surface conditions? With HGS, you know, we can do just a single domain, so you can simplify the model considerably depending on your use case. Uh, for problems that, let's say, uh, involve quantifying ET, then obviously you're going to want to carry a lot more refinement near surface so that you can resolve the, the root depth profile and get a more accurate quantification of the evapotranspiration, uh, both spatially and temporally. Uh, maybe you're looking at a contaminant transport problem. You'll want to think about, you know, mesh, mesh resolution. Uh, maybe particle tracking can be of use before you go to full contaminant transport simulation to help guide that mesh resolution and refinement. Um, and then we've got some other tricks within HGS where you can take an existing flow field and use that to drive a, a transport simulation so that you're not solving both flow and transport at the same time. It's a way to really gain efficiencies and leverage existing flow simulations. Uh, the other one we're looking at here is winter processes. Uh, this can also go for PET as well, where sometimes there's multiple methods for calculating different types of processes. And so you really want to think through what is the appropriate method and do you want to do an internal calculation in HGS or if you want more control, you can always do an offline calculation and feed that in. An example of that might be, be say, using a full energy balance solution for uh, snow accumulation, snow belt. That's not really an HGS, but you can compute it offline and then add it as a boundary condition into HGS. Um, and we always recommend start simple and then add complexity as you get more comfortable with the model. The main benefit of this is it helps define any errors in setup or bugs, conceptual issues. Um, I put the asterisk there because if you've built the same type of model many times, you could definitely jump further ahead as you get that experience. But for newer users, it definitely makes sense to start simple and then layer in additional boundary conditions, um, you know, domains, et cetera, and, and check the model at each stage to make sure that it's behaving the way you would expect it to. Uh, a few other considerations for the conceptual model. Um, you know, this we're spending a lot of time on this because it is such a critical stage, and a good conceptual model does guide the model construction process. 
So you want to get that correct up front. Um, likewise, if you have a bad conceptual model, that's going to carry through your model build and application process and may come back to bite you later on. Um, I like to think of the conceptual model as kind of a living guide. I usually put it into like a PowerPoint presentation as like a dumping ground of all my data sets, conceptualization, et cetera. And as new data comes in from a site, you can update that and kind of keep it as a living conceptual model. Um, one thing we recommend too, and this is mostly targeting newer users who may come from different domains, um, is to forget about the processes that are internally handled within HDS and not forget about them completely, but don't try to control them is, is the message here. So um, sometimes we see groundwater only modelers who are new to integrated modeling who try to prescribe recharge within a fully integrated model framework and, and it doesn't work and it leads to all sorts of problems. So understanding kind of how to build the conceptual model and then apply it to HGS is a critical step to make sure that you're letting the strengths of HGS really excel uh, and not getting into to some of these common troubles and pitfalls. And Braden does cover that in his new user training course. So if you're uh, new to HGS, I would definitely suggest checking those out so that you can get some more in-depth insight into some of these considerations. So that was kind of the conceptual model, things to think about, things to be aware of as we uh, build up our models and or prepare to build up our models. Um, the kind of next area that we talked briefly about is data sets. Um, that was one of the questions that uh, came out of the Friesen Harlan paper. And, you know, definitely they would not have been able to imagine that these national homogenized uh, data sets would have been available for model construction back in 1969. We've come a long way with open data. Uh, what I'm showing here is an example of the data sets coming out of Canada One Water. Uh, many of these are directly applicable to a fully integrated model like HGS. Uh, so once you have your conceptual model in hand, you need to think about your uh, model domain extents. You know, is it going to follow a watershed boundary or is it following a site plan, et cetera? If so, what are the implications for boundary conditions based on that choice? Um, you know, your surface hydrologic features, both river network and lake bathymetry, these are useful for constraining um, your mesh development to make sure you've got refinement in areas where you need it. Uh, DEM is obviously critical as well. And then with that in hand, you can start to build your finite element mesh um, and also bring in additional refinement in areas where, where it's needed. Then we get into hydrostratigraphy and soils, so subsurface parameterization and conceptualization. Uh, land cover is also critical so that you can have appropriate vegetation and, and um, or land flow friction representation across the model. And then you get into your forcing data to drive, you know, precipitation, snow accumulation, snow melt, soil freeze thaw, et cetera. So once we've built the model, I'm going to skip over the running the model stage. We'll assume that's done. Uh, and just look at some of the typical model outputs that come out of a fully integrated model. Um, one that stands out as you know quite interesting is the recharge and discharge distribution over time uh, so here we're looking at an example from the great lakes region uh, soil saturation is also a, a one that comes out of hgs surface water flow rates surface water levels as well uh, water table position and groundwater levels etc uh, and then actual evapotranspiration. And there's a lot of other ones. These are kind of some of the key ones that stand out. Um, but if you're doing solute transport, obviously you can look at your know, transport distribu or distribution within the model as well. Uh, and all these can also be used as calibration targets, which is kind of interesting with HGS. So um, because it's such a rich uh, modeling framework, there's a lot of potential endpoints that can be used to help constrain uh, a calibration. Uh, and there's a paper recently that came out by Schilling et al. that looked at the benefit of what they call unconventional observation data. Uh, and I'll just read what they say here, but it kind of advocates for the benefits of the additional outputs from HGS that can be used to constrain a calibration. And they say in general, the reviewed studies confirm that including at least one unconventional observation type of a relevant process for the model system and for the desired type of prediction alongside classical observations strongly reduces the ill posedness of the inverse problem. Uh, that is, it improves parameter identifiability and reduces uncertainty of predictions made with the flow model. Uh, and uh, one of the calibration parameters that have been really powerful for us recently is actual evapotranspiration. Uh, and so the data that we would be uh, calibrating to would come from flux towers. Uh, they're becoming a lot cheaper and easier to deploy. 
and in some regions that actual evapotranspiration sink is a major component of the water water budget and being able to constrain that uh, for calibration purposes can significantly improve model calibration and performance uh, so i just highlighted that one because that's one we've been working with recently but a lot of these uh, outputs are very useful for for model calibration and when you're designing your model calibration you should think about what are the possible outputs from the model that would be useful for the type of questions and problem that you're you're looking at So the next thing we're going to talk a bit about is where does HGS excel? So or fully integrated models in general, but today we're talking, you know, quite a bit about HGS. Um, and really, it comes down to, uh, you know, if we're talking about a fully integrated system, issues where the surface water groundwater interaction is important. Um, you know, HGS can do a lot of groundwater only problems, a lot of um, deep subsurface problems where that surface water groundwater interaction isn't important. But if you're really taking advantage of the uniqueness of HGS, it's going to be uh, in the surface water groundwater interaction realm. So things like climate change impacts, uh, land use change impacts, uh, agricultural studies are, are one that we do a lot of work with. Uh, mining applications, especially in, in Canada, it's hard to uh, operate a mine and not deal with surface water groundwater issues. Um, Design topography, so this could be stream restoration, restoration, sorry, uh, design and analysis, mining closure, uh, planning and assessment for mine closure. Uh, it's also powerful in um, regions where maybe you have less data because it is a fully distributed model, and we have a sense of what the physically meaningful ranges are for a lot of the parameters that go into HGS, plus the support from remote sensing and these national scale data sets you can start to build models for ungaged basins and get you know meaningful insights from them it's not going to be perfect but it is useful um and even in, in models where maybe it's not necessarily for an ungaged basin but you want in inputs at locations outside of a calibration point you can still get meaningful insights even if the model wasn't directly calibrated to that location which is something you can't do with like a, an empirical model um the other kind of key benefit of, of HGS is that it can be applied across a very wide range of scales. So everything from the small column sandbox model all the way up to the continental scale uh, and everything in between. So there's many, many use cases out there. Uh, we've got a blog on the website that kind of talks through a lot of the recent publications. If you're also someone who has a publication that's come out with HGS, contact Braden. He's happy to post that on there. Um, what I'm going to do now, though, is walk through just a number of examples that cover different scales and really highlight um, the power of HGS across a number of different use cases. And I believe we're taking uh, a look across nine orders of magnitude in scale. <laughs> so it really shows how versatile um, this type of modeling framework is for addressing problems of different sizes. Uh, so we'll start from the small scale and work our way up. So at the, the very small scale, um, here we're looking at less than a meter squared. Typically for these types of problems, you're really digging into detailed processes, uh, trying to gain some understanding about the fundamental uh, physics of the problem you're looking at. In this case, we're looking at a study that came out from uh, Beth Parker's group at the University of Guelph, where they looked at the backward diffusion problem where you have a solute that diffuses into low permeability material and then even after it's been flushed you get this back diffusion out of the clay uh, and that's what we're showing in the from the paper here in the pictures uh, the top is just showing um, the visual representation of the plume the bottom is the numerical comparison and then on the right we see the simulated versus observed concentrations coming out of the sandbox as well so showing that you know for very small scales this is a groundwater only problem with transport um hgs is, is very amenable to it and applicable and then as we get a little bit larger here we're looking at uh, detailed soil moisture forecasts uh, for agriculture specifically. And in this case, uh, we're using uh, 1D column models that are five meters long. Uh, and this is a, a fully integrated model. So it's got surface water, groundwater, uh, evapotranspiration built in, uh, and allows for resolving in high detail the soil moisture profile within that soil column. Um, and in this case, it pulls uh, from those open data sets I was talking about, soil properties as well as um, like crop type. Uh, these can be overridden by the user, and then you can generate high resolution soil saturation profiles and forecasts uh, for a point of interest. Um, so that's at the 
order of uh, say um, several meters in size. Uh, if we step up to go a little bit larger, we're looking at hundreds of meters in size. Um, and in this case is an example with density dependent flow and transport, looking at uh, saltwater intrusion uh, along the coast. And particularly they were trying to understand the impacts of climate change. And if you had engineering structures like a dike, how that would influence um, water quality and that saltwater intrusion into the system over time. Um, and you can just see here, we're looking at the extent of the salt water in the middle and then the calibration between simulated and observed head. So this is at the order of several hundred meters in, in scale. Again, it's going to be fairly high resolution um, and at a scale where doing solute transport with density dependent uh, effects is, is meaningful and needs to be applied. As, as we go a little bit larger, we get to the order of uh, several kilometers squared. Uh, and this is an interesting paper where they built a model of a real site and use it as a virtual laboratory to look at um, feedback between different features of the watershed, specifically the slope of a watershed and the amount of nitrate um, that was loading to the streams and running off. And what they found is that there was a positive correlation between uh, catchment slope and nitrate loading to the streams because as it becomes steeper, there's less opportunity for the nitrate to infiltrate and degrade. Um, and so it runs off and then there's more loading to the stream in these steeper watersheds. So this is a neat example of, you know, you can take a real world problem, but then modify it as a virtual lab to start to look at um, some of these relationships between processes within the system. Uh, and again, this was a solute transport model on the order of you know several square kilometers. Moving a little bit larger, this is a, a mining application of eight square kilometers, uh, looking at reclamation of uh, an oil sands mine. Um, and this was one where they used the, the thermal transport capability with an HDS to look at the impact of soil freezing uh, on runoff behavior and uh, solute loading, if you will, um, with and without freezing conditions. Uh, the graph at the bottom right shows the impact of that. It's a little bit pixelated, my apologies. Uh, so the solid line that's dark is observed, the lighter solid line is with frozen, and then the dashed line is without frozen soil. Uh, and you can see that there's a huge difference in terms of the ability to represent the observed uh, runoff characteristics, really showing the importance of considering soil freeze thaw in, in northern regions. And what's interesting is not just is there a mismatch for the freshet there in the spring, but also that mismatch carries through for the rest of the spring where we get higher runoff peaks uh, for the non-frozen condition because there's still a lot more water in the in the system. And what they found is that by considering um, the frozen soil conditions, you actually get less chloride being released to the environment over an eight year period than if you hadn't. So this can have significant impacts for assessing um, engineer design plans. And so making sure that appropriate processes are included in your numerical model is absolutely critical when thinking about your conceptual model and, and model setup. Uh, moving a bit larger, this study is at the 190 square kilometer scale. Uh, this was a groundwater only study, but used uh, backward transport capability within HGS to look at uh, domestic well vulnerability from fracking operations within a watershed. And from this assessment, they were able to produce a vulnerability map for the watershed of interest so that they can start to focus on, you know, key wells for more detailed investigations to make sure that the water supplies are protected. Uh, going a bit larger, we're now up to 2,000 square kilometers, so about a 10 times jump. Um, and now we're getting to the scale where we need to think about um, sub subgrid features. So you may have uh, processes that are operating at a scale that are smaller than your mesh resolution. In this case, it was specifically looking at real storage uh, for which is a uh, subgrid dep depression. So you might have little ponds or potholes that are smaller than uh, your element size. And this is parameterized in HGS through a process called real storage. Uh, and this can be represented uh, spatially distributed in a spatially distributed manner. And that was a key feature that was developed through this paper by Steve Fry et al. And they use that to look at what are the impacts on, you know, real storage distribution 
and how that affects runoff. So the figure on the right shows um, the spring freshet and the impact of having more real storage in green reduces those peak flows. And so this has implications for land management and wetland management to make sure that, or, or shows the benefit of keeping these depressions in place um, to mitigate you know, peak flows and, and hopefully offset flood risks as well. And so these types of studies can be informative for decision makers when they're thinking about how to manage their watershed, maybe incentivize stakeholders to take certain actions to mitigate downstream runoff and, and flooding potential. Uh, so then now if we go a little bit larger to the Grand River watershed, which is where um, we're sitting today with Inequanti, uh, this is a 7,000 square kilometer model. And this was one of the first ones um, to really lay out the framework for how to look at climate change impacts with a fully integrated uh, surface subsurface model. And that was Andre Erler led that study. Um, and really nice methodology in there for anyone who's looking at, um, you know, applying climate change impact analysis to a fully integrated model. Uh, this slide just shows some of the sample outputs from that, but looking at you know changes in soil saturation under future conditions or uh, average groundwater recharge, average depth to water table. You can look at stream flows. It's really anything that can come out of the fully integrated model. You can do a you know future condition versus current condition and look at what the potential changes and impacts are to help uh, guide planning and decision making uh, for the future. Um, I think we've got just a couple more left for these sample applications, but I just really wanted to highlight, you know, the the different scales across which HGS can be applied to and how the types of questions that are being uh, looked at change as we go to the larger scales. Uh, this one is uh, looking at the Athabasca River Basin, which is about 160,000 square kilometers, uh, and specifically uh, Anti Wang at all. We're looking at the groundwater contribution across the watershed. Uh, that's what the plot in the bottom right shows. So the red is surface flow, and the oh sorry, the blue is surface flow, and the the red is the groundwater seepage. Uh, this study found that at the downstream end, the mean annual annual contribution of groundwater to flow conditions was about 45 percent which was in good agreement with uh, local isotope studies. Um, and for some of these large scale systems, really the only way to start to investigate um, some of these groundwater contribution estimates is through uh, numerical modeling. And we'll see that in the next uh, study here, which is looking at the, the Great Lakes. Um, and this is a model that uh, Bruce Shu and team built up to look at um, groundwater contribution and seasonality of groundwater contribution into the Great Lakes. And this was a very large model, 766,000 square kilometers. So obviously, you know, um, there'd be some upscaling, not uh, as much details you'd carry in a smaller model, but can still be meaningful to address some of these big picture questions. And, um, you know, it'd be very difficult to go out and measure groundwater discharge <laughs> along all of the Great Lakes, but with a numerical model that's calibrated, you can start to gain insights on, you know, what is the contribution to groundwater and what are the seasonal dynamics of it. And what they found is that there was quite strong seasonality with uh, groundwater contribution being highest in the winter months and, and lowest in the, the summer months. Okay, so the last one we're going to look at here is uh, just very quickly the continental scale applications. Um, and this is a very large model, 10 million square kilometers. Jeremy Chen did this as part of his uh, PhD study. And, you know, I think it's fair to say this is kind of a demonstration proof of concept model at this scale. Uh, but a lot of the lessons learned are, are supporting the Canada One Water Initiative, particularly around uh, data management, uh, data collection, the value of homogenized data sets. And, and now for the Canada One Water Initiative, they're actually taking and breaking this model domain up into still large pieces, but into smaller pieces so that higher resolution can be carried within the model. So, so that was just a quick tour of kind of the uh, some of the use cases of HGS to get people thinking about, you know, different types of applications, different scales. Um, I think importantly, you need to kind of match the scale of the model with the questions that you're asking. And this table or this this figure is just a kind of a summary. is by no means set in stone, but you know, at the small scale, you're typically looking at, especially the very small scale, looking at 
models that help to support process understanding, maybe running experiments to support upscaling. It's probably going to be looking at, you know, solute transport, soil moisture, maybe fracture dynamics, very small scale, detailed uh, process models. And then as we get larger, the questions start to change a bit because you obviously can't carry the same level of detail. So you need to start to upscale um, some of those small scale processes. Um, you know, as you get to the site scale, you can start to really look at, you know, engineering questions for maybe it's a detailed engin engineering design, mine application, um, stream restoration. As you get bigger, um, you know, you might be getting to the watershed scale. You can still carry some local detail, including, say, mining applications or industrial activities. Um, but the questions may start to change or you may start to get into some upscaling representation, especially as you start to get above several thousand square kilometers. And then when you get to the large basin scale, um, you're starting to look at big picture questions, you know, climate change impact, land use management, um, any smaller features are going to have to be upscaled in terms of their representation in, in some way as well. Um, just to kind of cap off the, the model phase of this talk, just wanted to show, you know, integrated models and here we're just looking at hydrogeosphere and their mentions on google scholar over time so this curve kind of matches what we were seeing for that freeze in harlan where definitely we're seeing uh, increasing uptake within the community uh, as hgs and integrated models become more more widespread and more widely used I know we're getting close on time, Braden, so I'll try to get through this last section uh, quickly here. Um, so just coming back to the, the definitions that we had initially with model and digital twin. So I, I put digital twin in the camp of, you know, moving beyond Friesen Harlan. So Friesen Harlan really focused on the model aspect, but the digital twin piece has taken the Friesen Harlan framework and extending it into an operational decision support type framework. Um, and that's where we have a, a real-time forecasting pl platform called HGSRT, and it takes an HGS model and turns it into a digital twin. This figure kind of shows a schematic of how, is that, how that's done. So at the heart of the platform, we have an HGS model of the area of interest, usually a watershed. Uh, we ingest data from the field, uh, so it can be remote sensing, stream flow, soil and moisture, groundwater level data that is used um, to update the model, to have it reflect current conditions. And then uh, we use weather forecasts to drive the model forward to provide uh, forecasts from that hydrologic model. And so with this, we're, you know, pretty close to that definition of a digital twin where it's, it's living, it's bringing in data from the field, and then it's providing insights back to the stakeholders and decision makers. And we'll just look at a few kind of sample outputs that come from this. Uh, so here's a you know surface water depth distribution map. Um, so any of the outputs that come out of HGS can be displayed. Uh, we're looking at you know stream flow through time as well. The solid black line is the observed, and then we do a probabilistic forecast. So you get the median response shown in red, and then the 10th and 90th percentiles in green. Uh, these types of forecasts can also be done for uh, groundwater levels. Uh, soil moisture. So really anything that's within the fully integrated model framework can be pulled out in a forecasting uh, application and displayed or shared with the user. Uh, recharge is another one as well as, as groundwater discharge can be displayed and shared. Um, and then recently we've added in uh, water quality and this is a machine learning water quality forecast where it's been trained on historic water quality data as well as historic HGS simulation model output. So this is a really interesting pairing of machine learning with a physics-based numerical model that can yield um, you know, pretty interesting insights and provide water quality forecasts that otherwise would have been intractable with trying to solve the advection dispersion equation at a, at a watershed scale. So primarily we've been focused uh, on building this up in Canada. You know, it's you always want to get started in your backyard and, and test things out. Um, we currently have a number of different deployments across Canada. Our first one was with the South Nation watershed up near Ottawa. That's about 4,000 square kilometers. Uh, we've also got the Southern Ontario platform, which is about 76,000 square kilometers. The South Saskatchewan River Basin is about 120. Uh, Assiniboine River Basin is about 150,000 square kilometers. And then the Pemina Valley is uh, 
just over uh, is about 13,000 square kilometers. And what you'll notice with um, a lot of these larger platforms is we've taken and broken the models up into smaller pieces, typically around 10,000 square kilometers, so that we can better answer local questions with the forecasting models instead of having these very large uh, river basin scale models. So currently we've got 30% uh, coverage of Canada's habitable landscape and about 38% of Canada's population covered with these forecasting platforms. Um, so, you know, the question is, why would we turn a fully integrated hydrologic model into a digital twin? Um, you know, one, one of the early motivations was to get out of the routine of building a model, writing a report, and then having it sit on a shelf and die. We wanted to, you know, turn these into living, living tools that can, uh, you know, really allow the the client or stakeholder to get the most out of their investment. Um, you know, some of the other interesting things that come out of it is you may get into new st stress scenarios where you can get more insights on your model ability and so find new mismatches between simulated and observed and improve calibrations um, and then also can support you know um, site operations and management and really you know the focus is on decision makers who maybe aren't technical in their own right but uh, or technical enough to dig into say a fully integrated model, but can val gain value from the outputs that come out of the model, and so bridging that gap between you know really detailed technical output from HDS to a simple to understand simple user interface was a, a big motivation in the early stage of building up this platform as well. Um, so some use cases, uh, you know. Flood and drought forecasting are some obvious ones, especially as seasonal weather forecasts become more common. Um, field sampling and monitoring, planning and guidance. So using these models and to help guide decision making in the field. Um, lots of potential agricultural operation or applications as well. Um, mining applications, anywhere where real time uh, insights from a model could be useful. We can also layer on things like automated alerts. So if a forecast is showing that uh, a variable of interest is going outside of certain bounds, you know, you can get an email or text to, to be alerted. And then also these forecasts can be pushed into other dashboards and water management tools. It doesn't just have to be through the HDSRT website, you know, the, lots of integration with other platforms. Um, so that was kind of the, the digital twin side of things. I know I went through that a bit fast, just cognizant of time here. So I just got a few slides to wrap up, kind of looking at where we're heading with the science, uh, kind of what the future is going to bring. So if we take a look at the model side of it, which is hydrogeosphere, um, you know, we're continuously developing new features and processes. Some interesting ones that are coming up are uh, dynamic meshing, which allows us to modify node elevations during and change material properties during a simulation to represent, say, mining or land subsidence without having to do a snapshot simulation approach. Um, lots of stuff around water management uh, for routing water within the model or irrigating crops on demand, those sorts of water management applications. Uh, we're also looking at coupling with other models. Uh, whether that be you know climate or weather models and land surface models. Uh, we've done some of that in the past, but the coupling should be a little more generic so it can work with more models more easily. Uh, also, uh, standard hydrology models for, for flood inundation like HECRAS, um, you know, HDS outputs can be used to drive those models and getting that kind of pipeline and process automated is something we're working on. Other models of interest would be sediment transport, reactive chemistry, and since there's a lot of interest in coupling with HDS, really we want to step back and look at that kind of coupling framework in general. Um, other things coming up would be the HDS GUI, which I mentioned earlier. So that's in partnership with Aquaveo. HDS will be plugged into the GMS GUI, and that's going to be pushed out in early 2024. Um, and then the last one worth mentioning is just the Canada One Water uh, initiative is is wrapping up in early 2024 as well. And a lot of those data sets, if they're not already publicly available, will be pushed out to the public as well, which can really support uh, rapid deployment of HDS models across Canada. Uh, when it comes to, to real time, um, some of the things we're working on 
or the digital twin side, some of the things we're working on are 1D soil moisture models and forecasting. So we talked about that a little bit uh, earlier, but having the ability for the user to, to trigger the models on demand, customize the parameterization, and then get the results back. We're also looking at extending water quality forecasting capabilities that we talked about um, to other parameters, but also, you know, there could be use cases for forecasting for contaminated sites with plumes, where there can be real-time feedback between field sensors and uh, maybe operations around pump and treat or, or plume management. Um, coupling HGS with machine learning is a, an active area of research for us. Um, we see a lot of opportunity for using HGS outputs to inform machine learning training, as well as supplementing some of the forecasts with using machine learning for short-term forecasts, but then rely on the you know physics-based numerical model for longer-term predictions where those tend to, to perform better. Uh, and then also allowing just more user interaction with the web platform for entering, say, material properties or water management scenarios, um, say, dam operations, those sorts of things where there's more of a uh, input from the user to help guide the, the forecasts that are going to be run as well. And I think this is where I'll wrap up. Um, so just a few thoughts on kind of what, what we need in the field. Um, that <laughs> first bullet training, training, training. I, mean, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity in university programs to get um, students thinking about surface water and groundwater as a holistic uh, water cycle, which it is, we all know it is, but oftentimes it's still siloed in universities. Uh, and really we need to, you know, find a way to, to kind of break down those silos and getting, you know, students who know both domains being graduated. Um, additionally, you know, th there's a, unfortunately a trend towards decreasing the quantitative requirements um, in some of these programs. And I think, you know, we really should maintain them or increase them if possible, as they have slipped a bit over the past decade or two. Um, and also introducing integrated modeling into to courses. So the release of the GUI should really help accelerate that. Um, but we do offer licenses to anyone who wants to teach with HGS. You can get licenses for free, and we've got some great examples of that locally with uh, Andrea Brookfield at the University of Waterloo and Jana Levinson at the University of Guelph teaching with HGS in their curriculums. Um, and then also just, you know, there seems to be a bit of a gap or disconnect with um, the decision makers and stakeholders uh, in, in government and regulatory agencies. So figuring out how to bridge that gap through education and outreach and increased stakeholder engagement, uh, just so that everyone's aware of what is possible with modern tools and what the state of the science is. Um, so with that, um, there's a bunch of references for the uh, example applications and other kind of interesting big picture papers that were shown. Um, if anyone's interested, uh, reach out to Braden. He can make this available to you. And with that, uh, I will stop and pass it back to Braden for any questions. Thanks, Berg. The, uh, Steve, that was <clears throat> that was really good. Um, I haven't seen. Oh, there's just boom. A bunch of questions just landed. Um, so maybe we can go through these one by one. Steve, if you have access to the chat, I'll just let you kind of read through them and answer them as you like. How does that sound? Uh, yep, one second. Let me just see if I can find the chat here. Oh yeah, there's a lot. Okay, I gotta get to the top. <laughs> uh, no. Okay, yes, uh, slide deck um, will be, the, the presentation will be posted. I don't know if we're gonna uh, share the slide deck uh explicitly Braden. i don't know if you can answer that one or not if we yeah typically it's, share the it's slide really text. just um it's just the last post has a long series of questions oh, some okay. of which were already answered in the in the presentation but i'll just maybe make a note about the slides um it usually takes me a day or two to sort of format the video and get it uploaded onto youtube at which point i will send a follow-up email to everyone who registered uh, just providing you with the link to the recording so you can review at a later date since there is a lot of interest in having access to the slides, I'd be happy to share a PDF of those uh, with you at that time as well. So just keep an eye on your inbox and uh, I'll definitely be following up with those things. Um, I can, since I'm already talking, I will just make a couple of other quick notes. I just wanted to point out, Steve did mention this already, but I, I want to point out again that almost all of the sample application slides that you saw presented here, uh, they are they can be found, these papers and, and short sort of um, 
research highlights can be found on our blog. Um, several of those press of those research papers also have webinars that that we've recorded. So, for example, the saltwater intrusion sample application that Steve shared, we actually just hosted a webinar maybe a month and a half or two months ago with the lead researcher. Um, so check our YouTube channel. There's plenty of past webinars and, uh, you know, presentations with focuses on on different types of sample applications. And with that in mind, I also just want to point out that we have one final webinar for the year um, scheduled for next Wednesday from 11 to 12 p.m. or 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, that webinar is going to be delivered by some collaborators of ours at Ducks Unlimited Canada. We built uh, with them a watershed scale model of the, the Dog Lake watershed. I'm not exactly sure where that would fit in the scale, the size scale range, um, but the, the focus of that research project was really on evaluating the impact of wetlands on maintaining base flow to streams. So that'll be another interesting webinar for you before the end of the year. Um, those are all my notes, other than a thank you, of course, for everyone for attending. I'll pass it back to you, Steve, uh, now that you've had a chance to look at some of those questions. Yeah, thanks, Brayden. Yeah, I just chewed through here. It looks like, so most of them look like um, were from one person, but I'll, I'll answer a few of them. But I think, Tahera, it'd probably be good for you to connect with Brayden as well to dig into detail on some of these. Um, but I think one kind of interesting question is about computer resources and spe like what the computer specification would be for running some of these models. Uh, so typically we run our models on high-end gaming PCs. So, you know, good i7 chip, uh, maybe 16 to 32 gig of RAM, uh, SSD hard drive, nothing fancy. Um, we do start to do our calibrations on larger servers and stuff now, but for a single individual run, uh, a, a good gaming PC uh, is more than sufficient um, for that. Uh, I see another question here from yeah, Ming about visualization. Um, so, TechPlot is, you know, the, the tool we use in-house primarily, but we do support Pairview as well, which is uh, open source. And it's kind of like the open source version of TechPlot. And then also through the Aquaveo GMS uh, GUI integration, they will have some visualization tools available there as well. Um, see another one here about hydrostatigraphy. So it, it really depends on the... Um, location you're working in if it's um you know let's say large scale watershed we'll probably start with um open at, open data sets so like in canada there's the canada one water data sets now that can get you base hydrostrat and then you could refine with local information um if you're working at a say a industrial site typically they'll have um hydrostratigraphic information that you can use as well to to build your models uh we tend in-house tend to work through um gis and leapfrog but there's lots of other um different tools available out there as well that can then be imported into hgs for building up your geological model um okay just looking at the next question here from delanga uh, oh sorry it's moving up the screen uh for water quality is it possible to model pollutants concentration based on data of the groundwater near the body of water yeah, so it, we, you can use the advection dispersion equation to simulate um, the movement of solutes within the system. Obviously, it's going to depend on your scale, the amount of information you have available to define your source zone. Is it you know point source or non-point source? What are the dynamics of your solute of interest? But there is a lot of literature um, that talks about HGS being used for water quality modeling. Uh, and if you have any questions um, in addition to that, please reach out and we can help with that. Um, uh, any other ones you want me to jump on, Braden, or just? Um, yeah, I've been trying to answer a few here as we go. I think, given the long list of questions from Tahera, I'll probably maybe just have a follow up call with her to go over some of those, uh, considering many of them were already answered as well. Um, mm -hmm. but I th think we've answered most of them. Oh, there's a couple of new ones coming in here. So, is HGS compatible with Leapfrog or? Can it import a leapfrog model directly? Yep, so I can take that one. So at the moment, um, it's compatible in that you build up your hydrostratigraphic model within leapfrog, and then you can export the surfaces and then use those as layer control within HGS. Um, another workflow we've had is to 
build a uh, fee flow model uh, within, like build a fee flow grid within Leapfrog, export it, and then map the uh, zone distribution and within to HDS. So there's a couple different ways that it can be done. Um, next one is talking about surface water groundwater coupling parameters um, right so for that there's a term that uh, a key term called coupling length and in that case um it there's there's a, actually a study out i think it was around 2010 um i can't remember if it was jessica leger or perhaps someone else but um, they looked at the sensitivity of models to coupling length and um in general, they found that is with if you're within a fairly like within a reasonable range, it's fairly insensitive over several orders of magnitude. I think we typically use on the order of you know one centimeter to maybe ten centimeters. It is a little bit scale dependent. So larger models you might go a bit larger, smaller scale models you'll go a bit smaller. But there is some literature out there on um, setting up those values. Uh, Braden, yeah, I haven't we're seen past any other, one, so okay. Yep. Yeah, I haven't seen any other questions come in. I just wanted to make one um, extra little comment just about uh, visualization capabilities. In addition to pair review, we have also recently been working on some commands that would allow us to export HGS model outputs as a point cloud, uh, which would allow users to just visualize HGS outputs directly in GIS. That's not quite available yet, but uh, should be coming down the line pretty soon. Um, just need to do a little bit more testing on that. And yeah, there were no other questions. So I guess I'll just wrap things up here. We are after the hour. Thank you everyone um, for attending the training course, or sorry, for attending the webinar today. If you are interested in learning more about HGS, we have a webinar next week. We have a free training course tomorrow afternoon. And if there are any other questions that come to mind after the web, you know, after the meeting ends here, we are available to answer questions anytime. Just reach out through our, our emails. Again, my email is listed in the chat. You can also email us at info to quanti.com. So uh, one final thank you very much and have a great day. Thanks for hosting this, Braden, and thanks everyone for attending.